we can't talk ethics and technology these days without talking about social media. So let's start there. Social media has a, had a wild last 10 years in terms of perception and reverence. Uh, about 10 years ago, we had the Arab Spring revolutions, and it seemed like social media was a place where the many could rise up together and organize, and there was consensus that it was making the world a better place. Uh, and more recently, you know, social media has been responsible for a lot of misinformation and fueling the rise of nationalist leaders and whatnot. It feels like there's consensus that's terrible. And so I wanted to throw out to Tristan to start, you know, which is it? And is there a way to get some of the former without the latter? And then I'll throw it to Andrew. Yeah, um, well, thanks obviously for, for having me. And it's really good to be here with Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that we have to look at is the business model of social media. So, you know, if what, how much have you paid for your Facebook account, you know, recently? You know, not much, but how is it worth $500 billion? Well, they don't just make money on, on data, they make money also on attention. If no one actually spent their attention on these products, then they wouldn't be able to show us advertising. And the problem is they need that attention and there's only so much of it. And when they granted each of us our own platform, each of us became our own broadcast channels. We had this finite pool of attention that you have, the 24 hours you have in a, in a day. And that started getting fragmented and fragmented and everyone was competing. And so it created this race to the bottom of the brainstem. So when similar to kind of capitalism, you have late stage capitalism that's hyper aggressive. Everyone's in hyper competition and consolidation to fewer firms. With technology, we have this hyper aggressive race for attention that becomes this race to the bottom of the brainstem, where the you know limbic system and our amygdala are on the pushing its finger on the scale. So the kind of fear and the outrage uh, end up making its way to the top. And I think that competition for attention accelerating and getting more and more intense uh, and being weaponized is one of the big changes that's that's happened, and it really does come from uh, the business model. Yeah, I I agree that a lot of it is. Um, the fact that firms get economically rewarded for uh, clicks and engagement, which unfortunately corresponds to negative sentiment more than positive. Uh, I just yesterday was talking to Jaron Lanier, who I, I think you, you all know, and, and he uh, said something a while ago that really says it all, which he says that just negative ideas and sentiment spread more powerfully and viscerally through social media networks than positive. So the positive messages are consistently outgunned and then it's compounded by the fact that these businesses are incentivized uh, around uh, what's more engaging and engrossing. Um, so those are the things you have to disentangle. You have to somehow make it so that the firms uh, aren't rewarded just based upon like this war for attention. Uh, and then you need to counterbalance the fact that negative ideas are much more powerful in these networks than positive. Uh, but that that's one reason why, in Jaron's words again, it seems like these social media networks are making us all more paranoid and irritable. Uh, and that's a very, very negative state of affairs for individuals, but also for a society and a democracy. Just on, you mentioned the attention economy and, and where it is that Andrew approached, approached you after your TED talk to talk about creating a department of attention economy. Can, can you guys talk about that first meeting and what that department would have done? Andrew, do you I'll, want to talk about it? I guess I, <laughs> should I lead off on this? Because it's why I Yeah, go for it. it. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I saw Tristan speak and I think Tristan uh, has hit so many important issues. And more than that, he's actually uh, trying to uh, generate real solutions. The problem is that Tristan's organization, Time Well Spent, um, like doesn't have the keys to the kingdom in terms of these tech companies where he can make recommendations and suggestions about different design choices and, and calibrating um, these social media networks in different ways. And they'll be like, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> so, the, so the question is how to make that a more meaningful exchange where even if it might uh, impede their profitability like by a smidgen, that they need to engage more meaningfully um, so my vision is that we started a Department of the Attention Economy with the uh, clout of the federal government. Um, you don't want to be too heavy handed. You don't want to be like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Like you want to have it be like a, a real uh, sit down. Uh, but with like the message behind it, it's like, and if this conversation goes nowhere, then like maybe like, in, you know, some regulations are coming. And then you have someone like Tristan lead it so that Tristan can go in and have these same meetings. but a lot of these companies will uh, take a, a, a much more serious look at the changes he's 
championing. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, and it's funny because both Andrew and I, I feel like, um, at least I feel like my career was launched on the Sam Harris podcast and I was just hearing Andrew, uh, on, on there. And I yeah, actually got too. to that Where TED talk because of Sam's Sam. podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, no, but it's it's funny because I didn't I didn't you know you came up to me and I we didn't you know we hadn't met and I didn't know you were running for president. You said I'm running for president and I'm going to do this whole thing and it's been just amazing to watch. Um, honestly, since since twenty it was 2017 that we met, so yeah, um, it's 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 crazy to see see all that change. Um, yeah, adding to that, I mean that these companies aren't evil. They're not trying to do this evil thing. Um, and people in the tech industry have the best interests. I think. Uh, many of them have the best interests of, of people at heart. The challenge, and we can't get rid of the attention economy. It's not like we say, oh, we, we have this bad attention economy, we gotta get rid of it. There's always going to be a competition for attention. So the question is, how do we make it healthy? And I think much like the Environmental Protection Agency was sort of saying, okay, yes, we can drill for certain kind of fuels to, you know, we have to support an energy economy, but we need to do it in a way that preserves, you know, the natural habitat or not cause climate change or all these other things we should be concerned about. Okay, we need to get people's attention. And we're going to have to let people have their own, obviously, you know, rights to, to spend their attention on things that they want to spend it on. But we can't just have this sort of unmitigated race where there's an incentive to polarize people. Because one thing people don't really see is, um, in the attention economy, I do better if I give you your own personalized Truman Show, like a channel where you just get the things that you click on more. Because you click on things more if I give you more of what affirms your beliefs about reality instead of constantly challenging you and showing things from across the aisle. And so what that means is there's an incentive to create this sort of bubble that you're just, you know, seeing things that agree with you. And, um, uh, you know, this, this has gone on for many, many years now. And so long as that's true, you're going to get hyperpolarization and, and extreme stuff kind of rising to the top. Um, up until recently, YouTube had actually recommended uh, crazy levels of conspiracy theories uh, they recommended uh, Alex Jones Infowars videos 15 billion times. Someone who said that Sandy Hook was just crisis actors, and you know, where people lost their lives. Um, and obviously, things like pandemic and the age of coronavirus have have kind of made this more uh, obvious. And it's the cost of this is, is is much more subtle. I think of it kind of like the climate change of culture or social climate change, because um, essentially it's an extractive model where we have to drill deeper and deeper down into strip mining human cognition to get that attention out. And when we start running out of attention, we have to start fracking for attention. So we have to split your attention into multiple streams or two, three, three streams. I and like, then, I like you know, this it, metaphor, Tristan. Now we're like fracking for attention. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hate fracking, which is so it's easy to get me on board with not liking this situation. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, and, and and I think you know. So the point is, we have to go from this kind of fracking-based attention model to a humane and regenerative attention model. Because again, we're going to have an attention economy. But what are the rules we want to play by? I mean, I think to Andrew on the debate stage. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, does he, he, he could pick a fight and he could get a lot more attention and triple the airtime he gets on a debate. But Andrew is not like that because he actually cares about like, let's just talk about what we want to get out there. Right. And I think, how do we have a humane attention economy where we're competing with rules that actually allow the right values to emerge? We actually get to have the real conversations. Yeah, I was saying that to a friend the other day. It feels like we're not standing on the same foundation anymore. So of course we can't talk about what we should build. We're not, we're not in the same place a lot of the time and we can't agree on the basic facts. Uh, can't agree more. You touched on a lot of uh, what will be answered to this next question, but it, it's worth mentioning it's an election here, uh, here in the United States. Uh, in what ways should we be integrating technology into our elections to make them more free and fair and representative? And then in what ways is current technology harming or threatening to harm our democracy? This is a very big question. Um, the single biggest issue I think we're going to be facing in November is really people's ability to vote. Um, so there's this technology called uh, mail <laughs> that, that you hope that people can uh, vote from home because some people will be more reluctant to go to polling places. Um, but it, it's unfortunate that even the right to vote is being politicized. And the, the fact is, we, we're able to do a lot of things on our smartphones. Voting is not one of them. You know, we're still going to the high school auditorium and there are still like the people in the booth and like the, the pull down. And, um, and there, there are reasons why uh, we do it that way that are very legitimate. Uh, you know, like it, it's harder to hack some of the current systems, um, easier in other ways, but it's fragmented. Uh, like you couldn't hack it all. Um, and people have this, this concern that if you were to enable digital voting, that it, it would be more prone to interference. Um, but that's 
one thing we have to really start um, investing in meaningfully because the current system also is excluding people's ability to vote in various ways. Uh, the, the main thing, it, it really does um, echo what Tristan's saying about micro-targeting. Like the main way technology is affecting our democracy is the way people um, get their information. And more and more people are getting their information not from network news or cable news, uh, but from Facebook and their social media feeds. And they're getting very, very different pieces of information depending upon uh, what, what they've expressed some interest in um, in the past. And it is making it harder and harder to find any degree of unanimity or consensus where it seems like you're having two, or really in point of fact, more like, like 202 different conversations with people. Um, and it's very, very hard to have any meaningful uh, agreement or unified response to this pandemic in that kind of environment. Just that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the ability to find common ground is um, the, the hardest thing. And I think when you look over at the other side and you say, oh my God, like, you know, no matter what side you're on, right? I think you can look over to the other side and say, how can they just be so stupid? I mean, they, they, why, don't, why aren't they seeing, aren't they seeing the same information that I'm seeing? And the answer is they're not seeing the same information that you're seeing. That's the point is that we actually have this illusion that we are um, seeing very similar sources of information because then it would be obvious to everyone. But I think the mass fragmentation, which again preceded social media and technology too. I mean, the race for attention and polarization and, you know, the Fox News sort of left, and left media uh, split uh, has already created that, but social media exacerbates it and creates a democratization of that effect. Um, and I think the conspiracy thinking is particularly, or just think, I, we, we know it is incredibly dangerous because it is a trust bomb. It, it erodes trust in everything. Because once you flip into the mode of kind of paranoia and, oh, it's all this one big elaborate plot for this one thing, that framework of thinking as you start to believe it, um, you know, uh, really infects your view of, of all institutions. And I think there's legitimate reasons to question the authority and credibility of many institutions that have been failing us. And also, uh, technology that amplifies conspiracy theories makes us not trust anything that we see. And if you don't trust anything, that's trust is the foundation of a society. And so I think that that's like the, the, the critical thing. And if you look at things, you know, historically, YouTube has recommended things like the flat earth conspiracy theory hundreds of millions of times. Uh, so much so that Kyrie Irving, the famous basketball player, says that he apologized for telling his fans that the earth was flat because he said, I, I accidentally fell into this YouTube rabbit hole and people later, later talked to me about it. And uh, you know, I'm sorry for going, for going down that road. Even when he apologized, um, this is how cons uh, sticky conspiracy theories are. Uh, his fans, some of his fans said, oh, they thought that the round earthers had gotten to him. Because once you start believing in some of this stuff, you, it flipped your whole perception in a really dangerous way. And I think it's really hard to recover from that. So it's actually a really dangerous thing is, is mass rise in conspiracy theory thinking. And as our friend Eric Weinstein will say, some, some conspiracies are real, and that's what makes it complicated. But, but we, if we flip into a conspiracy dominant information environment, it's just poison for a democracy. And I think our adversaries like Russia and China are actually happy to have that spread as well. Tristan, I found a new term to describe myself, a round earther. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, we can be round, earth, round earthers. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to switch emergencies from the election emergency to the pandemic. You know, we are leaning on technology more than ever. Zoom, which was a fringe B&B &B service, B2B service, is now like part of everyday lex lexicon. Um, Amazon e-commerce in general have never been more central to our lives. Uh, what is the pandemic revealing and what is your highest hope for what comes out of this moment? Well, the pandemic is accelerating many of the economic trends that uh, were already in place, where I say we are experiencing 10 years worth of change in 10 weeks in terms of the adoption of e-commerce, online learning, drone, drone delivery, uh, smart robotics, telehealth. Um, a, a lot of this, unfortunately, is going to kick many Americans out of the workforce, where right now uh, we're looking at 38 to 39 million unemployment claims, which is an underestimate of the, um, the actual level of displacement, because uh, a lot of that, you know, a lot of people um, over in very tenuous jobs that aren't going to be able to, to file for unemployment. 
Um, and 42% of those jobs are gone for good. So you're looking at, let's call it 16 million jobs gone forever. Um, and uh, for reference, the Great Recession, we lost 9 million jobs or so. So you're looking at two times the Great Recession in perpetuity, if you are fortunate. Uh, so what do you do then? Uh, so we need to rethink and humanize the economy dramatically right now. Uh, we need universal basic income or some form of emergency cash relief to help support families during this time, but also to start trying to create the next generation of opportunities because 16 million jobs is a lot of jobs uh, and people when left to, to languish tend to atrophy after a number of weeks and months. Uh, and so if you can imagine 16 million Americans having their lives disintegrate, that's the situation we're in. The only silver lining is that we can accelerate meaningful solutions like universal basic income. Over 80% of Americans just came out and said they're for cash relief for people. Uh, you know, it's like, a, it's, and if you think about like, what do 80% of Americans agree on in this environment? Not a whole heck of a lot. So, this, so hopefully we can get some of these real solutions across the finish line. Just that. Yeah, I, I think, um, I just I agree with what Andrew just said, um, and I think the on the technology side, one thing that's made clear is how much large technology companies have become the default essential infrastructure for the 21st century. I mean, now everyone is like obviously relying on Amazon to get all the things that they feel like they need from home. People are relying on Facebook for the information. Like it was always true that Facebook was kind of the information gateway, gatekeeper for how we see reality. But now we're all stuck at home, and so we're looking through this kind of telescope of you know, Facebook and social media to know what is true in the world. And we're all, no one's kind of out there. Very few people are actually out there, you know, doing actual journalism actually out in the world. So we're all in this hyper distortion. So everything that was true about how technology was kind of distorting our perception or, um, you know, had these problems of misinformation or something is now just amplified. And so we like to say it's almost like an ergonomic chair metaphor. You don't really notice an unergonomic chair if you're in it for 20 minutes a day. But when you're in a un unergonomic, like non-humane technology for 10 hours a day, and it's distorting your perception, or it's not good for your mental health, or you feel this distance like on Zoom, you know, it, you start to really notice it. So just like we need to humanize the economy, I think we also need to humanize our technology companies to treat, you know, to be human-centered and put essential services, critical caring about people at the center of how it all works. And then the profit making can be happening on, on the other side of it. But we have to, it's now the new default 21st century infrastructure, and it should operate for the public interest. Well, Andrew, Tristan, thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you for everyone uh, who joined us and uh, you're watching Collision from Home.